Right. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for taking the time to come and learn um, and, and discuss openly with us this state of evaluation piece of work. Uh, it's something that um, the AES has invested in through the Relationships Committee, of which I am um, have been chair for about the past two years or so, and I'm now co-chair with Robert Sale of the, the Relationship Subcommittee of the AES, uh, which is a subcommittee of the board. Um, our aim here really, uh, I guess the genesis came from a feeling that the AES would benefit and its members would benefit um, more broadly as well from just a report that would take a bit of a snapshot of where the evaluation sector is at in Australia. So several several years ago, we started planning out this piece of work and starting thinking through how can we understand and what should we look at in trying to understand the state or the the the, the um, circumstances or the uh, environment for evaluation in Australia. So we might just start with scrolling through Rob in the slides. I think we go through some background. We'll, we'll cover today um, most of the main findings emerging from from the report, and we're interested in uh, facilitating some discussion with you as well about the sorts of things coming through, uh, the things that we've picked up. Um, things that may have surprised you, but also things that we could also look to dig a bit deeper into in any future work of this nature. Um, a little bit of the genesis here around what we were trying to study. And so that the, I guess the, the way this was all done uh, was that we set up a state of evaluation subgroup um, because the, the relationships committee is quite a large grouping. And we wanted to get some people involved in a subgroup uh, dedicated around this study, which we knew would take uh, a reasonable amount of resources and effort and thinking and planning uh, to get it done. So we, we developed a subgroup and through that achieved some terms of reference. Um, the broad objectives of the study, as you can see in this slide, was to give us that report that I, that I mentioned about what is happening in the evaluation world, uh, in or particularly in Australia understand the perception of evaluation among those who commission or use the outputs. So why is evaluation being done? What are the barriers and what are the enablers of evaluation? And then to really use this output, the state of evaluation report to have conversations and to, to put give the AS a tool or a uh, insight into the field that we can talk about when we go and have chats with other people. So that includes the AS, it also includes us as committees of the AS, it also includes you as evaluators and anyone really who's interested in talking about evaluation and understanding a little bit more about the sector. Um, this resource that we've put together, we think, gives a little overview of some things happening um, in the evaluation sector. So the project, uh, as it evolved and we set some the terms of reference, we, we needed a bit of extra legwork and so KPMG helped out as a, through a um, for an engagement uh, as part of this project to lead some survey work and interviews and case studies and data analysis uh, of evaluation volumes and some of the other resources that currently exist about evaluation uh, in Australia. So KPMG is acknowledged for their contribution to the project. Uh, but yeah, ultimately it, it the, the, the work was led by the Relationships Committee. Um, so myself, Jade and Rob really took a central role in driving this, this piece of work. I'll just note here a few areas that were out of the scope of work. Uh, one is around a judgment of the quality of evaluations that are being produced. We didn't feel that we would be able to do justice to that task. It needs a really dedicated methodology for that type of work. We were more interested in understanding what, why uh, evaluations were happening and, and why they may not be happening. And also um, we did, we did decide to include a bit of an analysis of the types of methods and approaches for evaluation that would be undertaken, but without a judgment of whether they were being applied with high quality or not, which is a quite a different task. So we have looked at approaches and we'll talk about that today. The effectiveness and, oh, let me just go back one. Yeah, so the effectiveness and impact of the studies themselves, we're not looking at how evaluations are used. Are, are the reports not only high quality, but are they being implemented? Are things being picked up from the report. So that needs another layer of analysis that wasn't possible. We also uh, wanted to focus on being the Australian Evaluation Society. We really had to limit the work to practice in Australia. 
we know there's Australian people doing evaluation and Australian companies doing evaluation in other countries and even government organisations and not-for-profits also doing evaluation offshore. We're really looking here at practices within Australia. And then finally, we know evaluation is not the only evidence-related evidence related field. There's things like monitoring, there's outcomes frameworks, and there's reporting processes and measurement of those things uh, was also something that we thought about early on. But really, again, as the first study, we said, let's just bring it back to evaluation projects and evaluation products. So there were some scope decisions we made fairly early on, which then flowed through into what we did and, and the way we did it. So um, there is room for questions as we go. So um, if there's relevant questions, uh, Jade or Rob or myself will just jump in and we'll, we'll discuss them as we go. I don't think we'd really need to wait till later to talk about some big things if there's lots of questions. So feel free to pose any questions early on um, that we might want to talk about as we go. So there's no, no issue with that. In terms of the questions, so these are the four areas of focus. So one is quite an ambitious one and Rob will talk about the results, but we wanted to understand if possible, and maybe we learn from the results of this, but is it possible to know how many evaluations are actually occurring across Australia annually? Could we could we somehow scale that? Um, is there, are there data sources and ways to understand that better? Um, how frequently and when are organisations evaluating? Obviously, there's very different organisations do evaluation from huge government agencies to very small not-for-profits um, doing, doing evaluation projects. So how often and why and when are they doing evaluation? And then if it's possible to link to the volume and how, how many evaluations are occurring, is it possible to actually understand how much is being spent on evaluation and come up with a quantification of the size of this field that we're working in? Is there, a, is there a kind of a dollar figure that tells you how big the evaluation field is in Australia? And from that, it can then talk to the importance for us as evaluators and for the AS and for the sector to do, to do that high quality and good evaluation and to build people and their practice for what is actually a fairly high dollar value industry in its own right. So this was, this was what we were hoping to follow up on in that area. In terms of the drivers of evaluation, so this is really the, the barriers and enablers question. So why is evaluation happening? When is it happening? And what decisions are being made about when it does or does not happen? Um, and yeah, at what point in the process of evaluation are evaluators engaged? Or in other words, what's the timing of evaluation projects? And then just broadly, why, why are they commissioned in the first place? I think we all probably have our own understanding of that and we can see the value of our field, but for others in, engaged in the study, why, why are evaluations being done or not done? In terms of the evaluation approaches, um, <clears throat> what does the evidence tell us uh, based on the surveys and consultation about the types of approaches that are being used in, in Australia? What Do we have a sort of prevalent forms of evaluation that we think are being driven more often than not? And um, what share of evaluations are being done within organisations by internal evaluators or externally by external consultant type evaluators or blended models of those two? So we're interested in that as well. <clears throat> and finally, looking forward, so based on where we are now, what sort of trends should we be preparing for as evaluators? And what, what capabilities and uh, things do organisations need to think about when they're preparing for evaluation? And broadly, where is the practice heading in Australia, if that's possible to predict based on the above questions? So that, that was what we wanted to look at through this study and get a bit of a, a sense of where things were headed um, and then use that, obviously, to drive those discussions about, about the field. with the AS, how can we improve what we do and the members and others involved in evaluation better? So next slide. All right, so the data collection. I think this is, is this uh, over to Jade? 
Yes. Okay. So thanks, Charlie, for setting the scene. I've got the task of sharing with them the methods that we used. I'm not sure if any of you have had a chance to have a look at the report, but these were the methods that the KPMB, KPMG project team used to kind of interrogate those four questions. So the first one was around focused around the volume question, and there was an Oz tender data analysis. And Rob will talk you through that results, but Suffice to say that was probably the hardest bit to really like nail that question and there's a lot more that would need to be done to really understand the volume of evaluation. The desktop analysis also included academic research or government strategy framework. So what else is happening um, in the discussion around evaluation and past AES papers? So some of the things that came up during the study, for example, are around conversations about professionalization of evaluation. So drawing on that um, repository uh, that the AES has of reports that, that have previously been done around those kind of issues. The key method with, though was really the survey of AES members, which we'll go into on the next slide and then supplementing that through stakeholder consultations and then a couple of discussion forums. So the project team had a um, challenging session, I think, with the AES fellows, particularly around like interrogating some of that um, volume data. And then we had a discussion at the AES conference in, in Adelaide in 2022 to say, you know, what do these findings really mean? What might be um, underlying some of those? So those insights have been put into the final report as well. So just on to the next slide about the survey. So the survey, the key limitation is that it was only sent to AES members, and this was kind of a decision made to contain the scope of the study, but also, you know, recognising it was just a first step and what was kind of feasible and, and possible to implement. So it went to all of the AES members, got a 15% response rate, which isn't too shabby, but also could be improved on if we did it again. I think you'll see that there's a strong representation of like private sector and consultancy respondents. Um, but then if you added all the government respondents up there too, that, that, that that's a reasonable response from government agencies. But we know that to kind of get a better representation of what's happening from the perspective of government agencies, we'd need to go beyond that, that AES member list. Then the this so the survey was supplemented with a stakeholder consultation. So we're aiming for up to 20 stakeholder interviews in the end. 14 organizations of sort of various types and sizes participated. And this was really to dig into the questions a little bit more around how is how are organizations structuring their evaluation capability? You know, is it a centralized unit? Are they um, planning to grow that unit? How are they managing things internal versus external evaluations? digging into more trends in different sectors. So this really sort of supplemented the survey data. And then just to be clear, we understand the study has like has strong limitations and it's really a, a jumping off point for conversations and for thinking about what, what do we as an AES want to know more about. So we know that limitation of only serving AES members doesn't really capture the full picture of evaluation in Australia. The volume question is the hard one. Um, and we need to recognise that while the project did have a budget, it was a pretty small budget study um, when you're trying to talk about what's happening in evaluation across Australia. I think it's over to Rob now. Yes, thank you, Jade. So starting with this first question uh, about volumes, uh, and I'll jump you to, I think, what is really the key kind of um, piece of data that we have to share here. Uh, so as as Jade mentioned, we, we looked at um, data from public sources such as Oztender uh, to get a sense of the, the volume of activity being undertaken. The focus was on one financial year, uh, which was 2021-22. And you know, I, I imagine your reaction is probably similar uh, to ours uh, and that of others who are looking at this, which is that the numbers uh, are quite a lot lower than we would have expected based on our own practice uh, and from anecdotal evidence. Um, I know, uh, for example, working in the NT uh, that um, I mean, I could count, you know, specific evaluations that would add up to uh, a lot more than than those that are shown there. Um, and I imagine that your reactions are probably similar. And this really, I think, reflects uh, limitations in the data that is publicly available. For example, um, potentially evaluations not being posted on some of those forums um, or 
uh, not being posted with um, titles that clearly identify them as evaluations. Um, I mean, potentially because people may be thinking of them in, in different ways. I think really what we could draw from this um, examination of evaluation volumes was just about the diversity of evaluations that were being undertaken. Um, so with the limited data that we did have, we could see um, a lot of diversity in terms of sectors, departments, uh, levels of government. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as, as Charlie hinted at earlier, um, really a key finding here in addition to that about diversity is potentially about the value of, of trying to make this information more transparent uh, or kind of doing more of a deep dive to, to try and understand um, more about this question. Before we move on, it would be actually interesting to check um, what are other people's reactions to these numbers. I know um, for the for the states and territories, to me they look very low. Um, what about the the Commonwealth figures? How do people react to that? I think it also tell something about the diversity of uh, government tendering websites, uh, which is reflected in the, you know, the data. And you may look at one website per uh, state, but uh, it's actually going through many avenues. Hmm. That's the challenge of capturing all that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think Martina has hit uh, one of the nails on the head there in saying that, you know, most government evaluation procurement goes through panels and so is not necessarily published. Uh, shout out to Please. Christabel, also in the NT, who has picked up that, yes, there's far more than four evaluations uh, happening in the NT. Sorry, Martina, were you about to say something? Um, yeah, just particularly any um, like consulting or strategy work that's under a particular dollar threshold goes to a panel typically rather than open um, because it's less work and it's easier for the people doing the procurement. And I think the majority of evaluation would be under that threshold, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, for me, thinking about, you know, if we were to try and repeat this exercise, in my experience, uh, panel managers don't necessarily have this data themselves about, um, you know, what projects are being undertaken. Do people have any thoughts or suggestions about what might be the best way to um, try and get a sense of evaluation volumes? Isn't there reporting against those pre-qualified panels as part of government? I think in some cases they may be, but certainly not in all cases, at least not public reporting. I think it's like an acknowledged um, cultural problem in some ways with the evaluation sector is that it's some sort of secret world where we provide targeted reports to specific clients about you know, their issues or their future, the future funding submissions, but that evaluation is probably not being used to its full potential in, in terms of a learning process and a sharing process. So I think that the hidden data around which evaluations are being happen, are happening is maybe because those who are commissioning the evaluation in the first place are protecting reputations, don't want certain, they don't want the full review to go public because it'll lead to criticism from media and others, um, uh, you know, other political interests um, who may use it against them. So I think there's maybe the perception or the cultural perception of evaluation is that it's sort of, it's almost like a secret world for, for in a lot of cases. So even if you could find out that there was a study done, can you find the actual study? So even out of the contracts that are publicly available, it would be another interesting follow on to know, is it even possible to track down those reports and I, I'm guessing no in most cases. Mm. So I, I just think there's a little concern for the sector that we should be aware of. There's a lot of work going on. There's more than what's here. 
it should be really across all sectors of public life, including the not-profit and government sectors, which is traditionally where evaluation sits, and academia as well. Um, but yeah, but our work's probably not being shared as widely as it can be. And we all think of ourselves as um, doing work for the public good and doing work that makes things better, but it's a very in a very targeted way rather than a, through sharing that information that may stand the test of time and be used down the track. So I think evaluation is becoming a point in time review process, maybe, which I think caps maybe its impact in some senses. Yeah. Could, yeah. I, just, could I just make a point, please, um, David Bruce here. I thought I would have thought the easiest way of finding out about volume is to ask members of the AES uh, what they're doing um, to provide um, a census of uh, of their activities from uh, one financial year to another. Um, it's clear that um, you know, we're not allowed to distribute our reports often. It's uh, it's not clear that we're not allowed. In fact, we are allowed in terms of the. Uh, proposals that we prepare to indicate what jobs we've been working on, because that's part of the process of uh, credentialing ourselves into the marketplace. Mm. So I would have thought that the easiest way of establishing the volume of valuations is to ask evaluators, what are you doing? And mm. what have you done it for? And what's the topic? And that's it. And that gives, and if you want to, you could also ask what the value was. Um, uh, and that would at least give some uh, better database than that which you've got in the present. Yeah, I, I think there's some some great suggestions here uh, in the comments about um, different ways we could look into this. And I, I believe in the survey that we ran, we did ask, for example, you know, how many uh, evaluations respondents had worked on. So that um, also is uh, um, interesting to think about. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll certainly uh, hoover up all of these suggestions um, to inform our thinking for for future studies such as this about these questions. Hmm. Any other comments or, or questions on the topic of evaluation volumes before we jump on to the next set of questions? No? Okay, so I'll hand back over to Charlie to talk through evaluation drivers. Yep. All right, thanks, Rob. Um, Look, I don't know if many of you are aware, I'll do, I'm just going to put something in the chat. There was another uh, report released today from the Centre for Economic Development of Australia. There we go. Rick's just done the description there perfectly timed in the comments as well. So I've just shared the link to a report, which is purely really all about evaluation uh, and the, uh, the need for better and more evaluation that is more in line with the amount of social services work being done to improve um, outcomes for disadvantaged Australians. So just worth a look at that link. Their attempt at working out volumes is to look at Auditor General reports and the, the test of how the evaluation framework's been put together and also uh, Productivity Commission studies. So they do a, a little attempt on, on volume and the presence of evaluation plans and evaluation work. So just another aside. Um, but lots of good info in that report that's somewhat parallel to the state of evaluation. So it probably covers some other areas we'll touch on. So the drivers uh, piece. So this is really suggesting that like why, why are evaluations being done? Um, so key reasons are around assessing impact, informing continuous improvement, ensuring accountability and supporting funding decisions. So probably many of the reasons that we're all fairly familiar with. Uh, understanding the impact is all about outcomes, informing continuous improvement, probably more about the implementation side of things, accountability. That's the question we have around accountability for funding use, maybe feeding into budget cycles, for example, um, along with that funding decisions, uh, recommendations and ways forward type of thinking that goes into evaluations. So study participants. Um, Again, we don't have access to the full bank of interviews done by uh, KPMG here, but the, we can really reflect what we um, heard back from them. But the participants that they uh, engaged with reflected pressure and scrutiny on organisations to meet community needs. So that is to account for the, the funding spent and talk about the impact of various programs delivered and to demonstrate 
the, I guess, effectiveness of the use of resources. So particularly since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and obviously with budget pressures and constraints. So there is um, that, that's the real accountability side of things coming through again there. Key enablers of evaluation practice included uh, like access to data and good data analytic um, capabilities, but also a strong organizational culture that where evaluation is, is normalized and really expected and, uh, and supported and funded. Some of the barriers to evaluation occurring are around where there's been a lack of funding allocated or committed as the program or, or project or, or syst systemic area has been uh, rolled out over time. Uh, sometimes limitations in the capability of people to undertake evaluation. So if an organization hadn't set funding aside to essentially hire an evaluator, um, they'd be looking internally. And then there's a question of whether um, the, the program staff feel that they have the capability and knowledge about how to, how to lead an evaluation project. Data availability is another one. So a barrier would be that an evaluation may not happen where the data is um, known to be challenging or uh, unclear or not incomprehensive. Um, and then analytical skills that go with the evaluation job. So this could all impact the timing, design, and use of the of the evaluation findings. So in a nutshell, that's the, the uh, key findings about the drivers of evaluation. So um, maybe next slide, Rob just shares a little bit of um, uh, data from the survey around the main motivations for evaluation. So as you can see here, for the for those in the the blue. Uh, or on the left of each of these bars is the, the non-consultant organization. So that's 120 on respondents, which is everyone other than the private sector consultants. And then the orangey red color is the consultant uh, responses. So for the non-consultant responses, the major reason for evaluating is to understand impact. So that, that's that outcome oriented evaluation studies. And uh, for the consultant evaluators, the main reason why they, they feel they're doing evaluation is to improve implementation. So really the two sides, implementation and, and impact come out first and second there. Then there's a few utility elements of evaluation. So to seek funding renewal, enhance accountability, and then quite low down on the scale, particularly consultants are seeing that only 13% are prioritizing it. The reason they're doing evaluation is to build greater knowledge. Um, some in non-consultant organizations see their role as building greater knowledge, but maybe that that's not, maybe something the field could be looking to improve that we can drive improved knowledge and and uh, practices through evaluation. Uh, yeah, meeting legislative requirements is sometimes a driver for evaluation. So if it's been planned and legislated, to give stakeholders a voice is another relatively low response rate area as the major reason for evaluating. So in Australia, we could we could probably conclude from that that evaluation is not being used to represent perhaps um, more marginalised or, or minority groups necessarily. So maybe more done for the like the big end of town rather than the, the sort of democratic or empowerment evaluation type of processes on the on the whole. To promote transparency, also very uh, much a small a small response rate there. Um, not, not all uh, evaluations, as we discussed, are being public publicised. So that's not a huge driver. Identify innovative solutions sometimes, and then to assess whether a program is needed. That probably links a bit with to seek funding renewal. So there's a little bit in that area too. So they're the main drivers. Um, yeah, a few interesting results there, really, from what is being prioritised versus what's not prioritised. So next slide is the barriers. So similar question on the left there in the survey, what are the major barriers to evaluation? And again, you can select up to three of these, but the first major barrier is the lack of funding allocation. So if evaluation is not planned and budgeted, uh, it tends to be less likely to happen. So I guess that's a lesson that we can systematize evaluation and make sure that it's planned and then it's more likely, uh, likely to happen. So if we, if we're pursuing that form of evaluation, um, it does need to be built in from the start. 
there may be um, again with shortage of, of time perhaps uh, also capability gaps where it may feel that the right people aren't available to lead an evaluation at some times in some organizations it's just a limited culture of evaluation so it may not happen for that reason shortage of time to complete evaluation typically that's a, a barrier that's run into when there's been a lack of planning for the evaluation from the start but where there's considered to be not enough time um, that's came came through there as well along with a lack of desire from leadership so again it's a whole of organization cultural positioning of evaluation where it needs to be accepted by an organization to happen um small response rate there on poor past evaluations so some evidence of that um, perception that evaluations may not be adding value and a very small number saying there's a challenge finding an appropriate evaluator so there you go um i guess those things are, are talked to a little bit on the on the right there from the consultation responses so capability issues around staff turnover or lack of formal qualifications or training or maybe comfort in evaluation and a feeling that there needs to be some level of baseline evaluation capability of all staff in an organization to enable the evaluation to be then embedded in the data collection process of programs um, it'll come through a little more in the trends but the data question for us as evaluators i guess is just gets increasingly um, central to what we do so there is myriads of data available for us as evaluators in many cases um, but we some external evaluators don't have access to that data and then we need to learn how to analyze and uh, assess results against that data uh, as well so there's a whole range of data questions for us um, and the, at the bottom there there's a little dot point additional barriers include an absence of program theory or, or logic which probably means lack of objectives being specified up front and a lack of a clear starting point for the evaluation challenges with information sharing for example across agencies or clients and then issues interpreting and presenting conflicting findings but yeah that's just something that can arise case by case so really that's that's broadly it on evaluation enablers and barriers any any questions from that content area charlie there's a comment from rick in the chat that kind of says um the, this data sort of doesn't support that consultants are the preferred evaluators for accountability i i wonder if the next time we did a survey like this presuming we do a next time we've got to define what we mean by some of these things too because perhaps like helping people improve might be a way of framing accountability and thinking about it, or it might be, well, the original purposes of this evaluation that you were commissioned to do was for a kind of accountability and measuring in impact, but actually the whole implementation slowed down and you're not yet ready to, to be commenting that way. So you, all you can do as an, the external evaluator is help improve processes and implementation. Hmm. But Rick, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything more to that comment. You might be just on the uh, on the typewriter. <laughs> uh, yeah, any other queries or questions about the barriers and enablers? Or we jump to approaches, maybe Jade. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I think this one I'll preface again with, gee, it's hard to get an agreement about what, what are the categories for evaluation approaches um, because everyone has slightly different ways of talking about these things. And so the list that we put in the survey to AES members is, you know, by no means the end list. But I think what came through strongly is, you know, there's not a lot of RCTs being done by um, AES members, which is interesting when you hear the dialogue around, um, you know, the call for more RCTs and evaluation. So do the results of our study suggest, hey, actually um, the way AES members and evaluators are thinking about evaluation is to design evaluations based on um, the questions to be answered and the context and the stage of development in a, um, in a program. So we're kind of using methodological appropriateness as a gold standard, but others might be thinking RCTs are the gold standard. So how do we have these conversations? Um, this might sort of yeah, reinforce the people in the tense views about 
what makes sense in terms of the evaluation approaches being used, but it also could be used to say, hey, more RCTs need to be done as well. Um, the things that came through the qualitative data were um, that more demand for rapid evaluations, particularly during the pandemic, which I think none of you will be surprised by. You'll see some of those coming through the AES um, sessions as well. And then there was that sort of move from some of the uh, government agencies that we were talking about about um, focusing on that internal capacity building and that might tie to some of the, the comments earlier in the study about you need some baseline capacity for evaluation across the organization to be for evaluation to be useful and used as well so if rob just goes to the next slide so this shows the results from the survey about what did um what did aes members say were the approaches that they were using so Theory-based approaches came first, and I think we had a description there like program logic or theories of change. So probably not surprising to anyone that that came out strongest, given that some agencies kind of have a templated approach to requiring programs to have a logic model um, or a theory of change to start off with. Maybe a bit surprising that emphasis around co-design, um, that there's often that need to collaborate around designing evaluation developmental evaluation, systems evaluation, maybe surprising how high that was. Um, but yeah, and then you can see it sort of gets less and less towards experimental um, designs down the bottom. Anyone got any questions about these categories or these findings? Julie just had one, a question in the chat about, don't you see RCTs as out of scope like monitoring? and so on. But I, I guess our, our response is that uh, it was in scope. So just to clarify, they were part of the experimental design category. Um, there was a bit of a discussion about this, Jade, at the conference about um, why experimental and RCTs were so seen as so low in the response rate here. And then I think our conclusion was largely that, that RCTs are really not happening as often in Australia as maybe in some other places uh, or jurisdictions. So uh, yeah, they were included. The data suggests that from AES members who are often doing or involved in evaluation that ICTs really aren't happening a whole lot right now. But there might be might be some happening outside of AES members. Um, but I guess, it, yeah, some of the discussion also at the conference was around the, eth like the ethics of setting up an RCT. Is it the right thing to be doing in certain contexts and that being difficult for a number of like the program areas that we're working into? Hmm. Was there any discussion on the typology? I, I find it quite quite good actually. The list here. Actually, I don't think anyone's discussed or critiqued the list. So. Yeah, it's, it's quite controversial sometimes. So I quite like it. We went through quite simple. a few different. Yeah. We went through. We, we really brainstormed this pretty hard in the survey design process. So we did have multiple iterations of this list. And um, this is what we really arrived at. I guess that, yeah, I mean, it really probably confirms what we probably all suspected that the theory based methods of what were objectives achieved are really the predominant form of evaluation in Australia. And that therefore you go through implementation and you look for evidence of, of outcomes. Um, and yeah, co design was like really much higher probably than many of us expected. But that's obviously the work that people are getting involved in now which tells me that evaluation sits somewhere between like end phase of an, in, of an intervention or a program and also designing better programs in the first place. So co-design might pick up some of that work around doing evaluation frameworks and evaluation planning and all of those things that get in the design process. Yeah, and I think Charlie um, Martinez just put in the chat, I think co-design probably in being interpreted in multiple ways. I think it is one of those things that people are interpreting multiple ways. And, you know, it's probably just like collaboratively designing the evaluation um, in general. And I think, Julie, that discussion about RCT is definitely back on the table, given debates emerging now. And maybe one of the next steps thinking about different evaluations is also how you can combine these different approaches too. Um, so you can combine things that on the surface seem difficult to combine, um, but can produce like different answers or like different provide different aspects to the key evaluation questions. 
And I think just Lucy's asked if there's any links between the purposes and the methods, but I think the way that the survey was set up because you could select multiple um, methods and purposes and it wasn't aligning around singular studies, it wasn't really easy to do that analysis between like for what purpose are we using, what types of approaches, but in the qualitative data there was that explanation of like basically we're using the approach that's best, um, that's designed to best answer the questions that we have and the, the purpose that we have. Emily, sorry, that's sorry. You go, no, you go. I was just going to point out that question from Emily about whether there are any differences between internal and external evaluators' views. I'm not sure if we did uh, break this one down in that way. I can just go have a look at the report while we jump yeah. to the next section. I'm just, I'm just looking at that now. I don't think we did get that breakdown in the survey breakdown data. So, um, no, I think the yeah, short answer I think is no, but. Um, if, if anyone else finds it, then let's share it. Okay, so uh, let's jump to evaluation trends. There were four main trends that came through in the survey results and the stakeholder consultations, uh, which we've summarized here. Uh, so one of those trends was around evaluation uh, commissioning models, uh, and in particular, I think about building internal capability and capacity uh, in evaluation, which is something that many organizations are seeking to do. Uh, what that looks like, I think, can vary quite a lot depending on the organization's kind of current level uh, of capability, uh, but it may look like establishing an internal evaluation unit, um, or kind of at the other end of the spectrum, it may just be around requiring capability building uh, as part of externally commissioned evaluations. On the topic of establishing uh, internal evaluation units, there are multiple different models for that, uh, ranging from kind of centralized units that are conducting evaluations themselves through to more decentralized units that are kind of supporting program areas to fulfill their evaluation responsibilities. Um, and stakeholders, I think, highlighted kind of some both opportunities and challenges relating to um, these types of units. So on the opportunity side, we were hearing that um, these units can help to identify and address some of those barriers to evaluation uh, that, that Charlie was discussing earlier, for example, around access to data or um, lack of evaluation capability. Um, the challenges associated with them uh, were around just the fact that building that internal capability is, is a long process that can take years uh, and obviously requires funding, which, which can be an obstacle. I think uh, another trend here is quite related to, to that one about commissioning models. Uh, and it was really just recognition uh, of workforce capability as something that impacts all aspects of evaluation. Uh, and so one of the trends that came through was around kind of the ongoing need to grow capability and evaluation at the level of individuals, teams, uh, and organizations as a whole, uh, and to, to build a culture where evidence and evaluation are highly valued. Uh, some of the consultations did touch on the potential for evaluation to be professionalized or for training to be credentialed so that evaluators can demonstrate their skills and experience. Um, and as we noted in the report, um, that is a topic that that uh, has been studied by the AAS before, um, such as in a 2017 ANZOG study looking at pathways to um, evaluation professionalization. Uh, on the topic of data, um, this came through strongly, as Charlie mentioned, as a kind of source of potential barriers to evaluation. Uh, for example, around accessing or, or linking data sets. But on the flip side of that, there was also, I think, excitement about the potential value of um, some new digital technologies, um, things such as artificial intelli intelligence in enabling evaluators to use large data sets um, in new and innovative ways um, and do things like, for example, like real-time monitoring of programs uh, and then a, a fourth uh, 
trend that came through very strongly was around Indigenous evaluation approaches um, and increasing recognition of the importance of ensuring cultural safety uh, and increasing the ability of evaluators to work in a culturally safe way. Um, stakeholders said that this was a priority for their organisations. Uh, they noted a trend towards co-designing evaluations with Indigenous peoples and communities, although, you know, as, as Jade noted earlier, um, it would be interesting to unpack what specifically was meant by, by co-design. Uh, something else that was mentioned, and that I think is worth a, a plug, uh, is the AAS cultural safety framework, which is very relevant uh, in this regard and is really worth reading if you haven't already. Were there any uh, comments or, or questions? Um, did did these trends resonate with people? Uh, was there anything that you you kind of expected to see here that uh, wasn't covered? I think when we were discussing it, we were kind of surprised by that emphasis on like capability and is there a need for professionalization or things like knowing we've had some of those in-depth conversations within the AES and not really hearing those conversations um, in the past. And so maybe this is like honing in on some uh, comments from a small number of stakeholders. Maybe it's not as big a concern as um, you yeah. suggest. So I, I might jump to um, a, a discussion uh, where we can kind of um, cover all of these topics um, in a bit more detail. Uh, so in particular, we've come up with a set of questions that we'd be interested to hear your views on. Um, so as I was starting to touch on earlier, those are about, you know, looking across all, all of the, the findings that we've discussed in this session, what most resonated with you, what most surprised you? What are the implications that you take away for your practice as an evaluator? Um, what are the implications for the AAS or the, the sector as a whole? And finally, what would you like to see explored in future state of evaluation studies? So what we're going to do, uh, we've got a bit over half an hour to go. So I believe we're going to break into breakout groups uh, and we'll take, let's say, uh, 10 to 15 minutes or so to talk through these questions. And then we'll come back and have a chat about them as a group to hear what uh, were the kind of key themes coming through in those conversations. Was I, Greg, was I correct in saying that we're going into breakout groups? Uh, you're on mute. Just setting them up now. So we've got uh, five of uh, four to five participants each. Each. Great. And we'll get people back in 15 minutes. Well, perhaps we can start with that conversation we were just having about evaluation volumes. And sorry, I didn't catch your your name. Uh, would Would you like to to kind of talk through what the discussion was there, France? Oh, <clears throat> oh I've dropped myself in it now. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, so what most surprised us was the low number, the low volume of evaluations reported. Yeah. Um, we, as I said before, we had um, people from different evaluation backgrounds, yeah. um, sectors. We had people in public and people in not-for-profit um, and a couple of different big uh, Victorian government departments, Department of Health, Department of Education, both of which have in-house evaluation teams. Yeah. Um, and so a few, quite a few different re resources or, or, yeah, resources were suggested that could have been accessed. Um, and I personally was surprised by the use of KPMG. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah, um, I won't say too much more than that in public, but um, yeah, that's just to get the ball rolling on that subject. Does anybody else yeah, want to sure. pick that up?
Um, yeah, our, our group also had the volume as a area that was surprising and for the low volume. So just reiterate that point. Yeah, I was in the same group as friends and I was interested to know why um, there wasn't anything investigated around the philanthropic and not for profit sectors and their commissioning of evaluation. Um, given that, you know, Paul Ramsey Foundation is, is just one example among many, um, does invest quite a bit in its evaluation practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and feel free to jump in, Charlie or Jade. But I think, I mean, what, while we did have some um, consultations with people outside of government, I think the reason for the focus on um, things like Oz tended to start with was really just a question of scope and and kind of about the limited like resources we had to to invest in the study so so i think yeah that would certainly be something that would be interesting to explore in more detail for future studies i think also i'd just say we did an attempt at a case study process um, which also included a case study from the philanthropic sector and the, uh, the some other case studies that one actually did get drafted but um the other uh, many other case studies ran into issues in publicizing a department's entire like approach and data set and um, there was some trepidation around that so the attempted case study process we learned was maybe not the best process that, to run in this case so um, we did yep. we did with the philanthropic sector though and we you know got some reasonable data back from that sector specifically and I think what yep. you've just said is a really interesting insight in itself is is that government um reticence to um talk about the evaluations that they do um hmm. and and understanding where that comes from because i i would certainly think that with the presence of government evaluators in the room here that the and and please stop me if i'm putting words in y'all's mouth but you know the, there is a desire to see that work be published but there is still a barrier there. And having been formerly in government, I, I've faced that myself working in internally. And yeah. and how maybe we address that as a field is a important question going forward. And I think there are sometimes good reasons not to like not to publish too when you've got like what what would that stop us saying that actually can like help organizations learn? Like if you've got a if you've got a report that you know is staying internal, you can kind of say all oh, the stuff that needs to be said to learn from. Whereas if you're if you know it's going to be published, the way that that report is framed and what goes into it might be kind of different too. Not that I'm not for sharing things, but there's you know that has implications too. Yeah. I guess in our group, and uh, I just find something is a little bit surprising. There is a slide showing quantitative funding and qualitative findings talking about barriers. So for the quantitative findings, it mentions lack of evaluation culture and also lack of leadership. Actually, I think the two factors is they interact because your leadership style will affect um, evaluation culture. But I'm just uh, yeah, it's a little bit surprising. The interview findings, nobody mentioned that. So I'm just mm. wondering who the interview is, because you would really think yeah, evaluation culture and leadership would be very important. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point in terms of, yeah, who, who would will we be speaking specifically to? Um, and I think, uh, I mean, Charlie or, or Jade, I mean, my, my understanding is we, we probably were often speaking to, you know, evaluation units or, you know, potentially more senior people. So, so that may be a factor in uh, that. That may have influenced the relative uh, prominence of, of some of those factors, which is interesting to think about. Maybe some of those are more like organisations with more stronger evaluation cultures too. Yeah, yeah, true. Mm, I think that's an excellent point that you make, Emily, in terms of those cultural aspects can really influence um, an appetite for evaluation and spending on it and transparency around it. Yeah. Um, would any other groups like to jump in uh, and report back on their discussions? We didn't really follow the questions, but um, 
Julie and Flo had some like interesting comments. So like, you know, this being kind of a, a good baseline, something that we can build on, but thinking about, you know, when we're just relying on commentary, actually there's a need to think about like, what's the, the history, like the policy history of this. And I'm not sure we've fully grounded the study in that. So thinking about, you know, the previous Commonwealth evaluation policy, like around requiring evaluation and there would have been better data. And when we say things like there's a growth in internal, um, internal evaluators that seem to kind of speak true but like since when and is that everywhere so there's probably some things that we could dig down into uh, we also touched on you know how does this fit with things like social enterprises and social impact measurement you know when and this is some of the conversations we've had in the relationships committee as well like that boundary around AES members because you know some social enterprises could value from uh, could get value from evaluations but they tend to be talking more about social impact measurement and that's not with us and so how do we build kind of bridges and relationships as well? And then we yeah. start talking a little bit more about like where to next for this study and how could you engage um, like government agencies in getting an next version of this study up? Like what might be interesting to them? Like how would they get value out of out of this? Mm. What would they want to know about? What would be a benefit for them to for them to learn from? Yeah. Sorry, there, there was was quite... Quite... Sorry go on. No, I'm, I'm not sure if I zoned out for a minute or whether Charlie might have mentioned that in our group we talked about the the timing of the conduct of the survey during COVID and um, that there was a not a surprise but it was interesting to see the number of rapid evaluations that were undertaken and and that sort of potential shift to that desire for um, quick results or a quick evaluation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we actually had some some similar discussions, um, I think, to your group, Jade, around the fact that um, you know, there are a lot of people who are doing things that could be considered evaluation who might not think of themselves as evaluators. Um, and that in terms of you know, future studies, it could be interesting to start delving more deeply into some of those like evaluation adjacent activities. Okay, were there any other uh, comments, any other insights that people wanted to share? So thinking about the, the numbers, the issues around the numbers, I mean, if we had to do this again tomorrow, it's a bit tricky and I'm not sure we'll never ever get to the bottom of it. And even the, remember, remember the New South Wales government did an exercise at the back of the 2016 Auditor General Report on Evaluation and tried to get some numbers about um, you know, how much was being spent internally. Yeah. And it was actually very yeah. difficult. So um, suggestion to rely on the AES members is actually quite, mm. because they always be here yeah. and, and they are representatives of evaluators internally, externally from all spaces. So I'd see the value of this kind of exercise focusing more on the, mm. the trends, the trends, what's happening, the kept, capturing the, the flavor of, of the moment and how, how it can be shaped. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's also potential, you know, future studies, iterations of this study don't need to be similarly broad in scope. Like we could do a study just looking at volumes and try to go more into detail. Yeah. Um, Verena, uh, did you have a comment? Yeah, thank you. I was just going to comment on perhaps an approach that might be uh, a little bit more fruitful going forward. I think You'd be surprised how much knowledge is within um, individual states and territories. And I'll give you an example. If, for example, like I commented in, I have got a very good view of what's happening in the Department of Education in Victoria. I can give you the numbers and they're not that far off. Also knowing in Victoria, the other central evaluation units, and then you combine that with knowledge from Department of Treasury and Finance, you would get pretty close to getting a, re a representative number. So I think mm -hmm. it's probably tapping into there is so much corporate knowledge within states and territories, and I think that could be utilised in a much better way. So I, I don't think it is actually that hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious we've only got a few minutes left and people are starting to drop off. So I'm going to throw to Charlie 
to um, talk about the next steps and wrap things up. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. This is the first session that we've run post release of the report. And um, uh, yeah, so the, the report's out there. Feel free to download it off the AES website. Um, we just put a new version in, picking up a, a table that had dropped out as well. So have a look uh, again if you've already looked once. So we may do other sessions like this with other state groups. Um, we haven't fully mapped out the next steps for the for the study. Um, but yeah, the report's out there now. Um, appreciate everyone contributing to today's discussion. And um, it was very much positioned as the first, potentially, of, of uh, a first of a sequence of studies, potentially, that the AES may run at certain uh, intervals over time. So we might be revisiting like what's shifting year on year uh, or every two, three years, perhaps, and undertake a, a kind of a re revised version with some different questions and different methods. We've also learned a lot from the process of running through this report and developing it over the last year and a half. So there's lots to learn as well from that perspective. Um, so yeah, like the whole thing's a learning journey for our sector and for us as well as for the AES and, and hopefully for you guys too. So um, yeah, thanks for contributing 